is known as the M8 Greyhound. This was armored reconnaissance for World War II. Yeah. Yes. Carried a 37 mil gun, whatever. Uh, there is also the turretless version known as the M20, uh, which is in behind the uh, the other Stuart. What you're looking at right here is an M4A3 Sherman. This was a later war Sherman. It was powered by the Ford GAA V8 versus the, rate, the nine cylinder radio. Do those things swim? Not without the dual drive attachment and the skirts and everything else. Shermans will not swim by themselves, no. Is there any tank that will? Yes. Which one? Um, I know the Sheridans were supposed to, the, the aluminum ones were supposed to have had an amphibious capability. Uh, most tanks, however, are meant to to sink. Uh, case in point, the T-72 that's over here, there is probably about a 15-foot mast that goes up on top of it, but because it's sealed for NBC, they can shut everything down and just simply snorkel the intake and the exhaust for the engine, and the commander's cupola, which has this long pipe on top of it, about 12 to 15 foot, and just hope for no leaks. Basically, you drive along the bottom. Right on the bottom? Yeah. <laughs> Next to it, we have what is known as a Fox. That's an armored reconnaissance car for the British. This particular example is used by the Desert Rats during Desert Storm. Uh, it still has their placard up on front of it. Next to that is an M29C Weasel, originally designed to retrieve pilots up in the mountains. Uh, if you look at the tracks, you'll see it's uh, very similar to like a snowcat. Mm. These were amphibious. You could bolt on a bow and a stern section, and these would uh, these would swim using their tracks for propulsion. Hmm. Further inboard, this particular beast here is an M3. It's a Grant. There were two variants. There was the Grant and the Lee. The only difference being, this would have been for the British and Commonwealth forces, Australia, New Zealand, whatever else, as used by. Montgomery skies from basically Al Alamein onward. The American version, M3 Lee, which we used starting with Operation Torch, had an extra cupola that could handle a 50 cal on top of it. Mm -hmm. This carried the 75 mil main gun and a sponson on the right side and a 37 mil in the turret because we did not have the capability to produce a turret that would handle the 75 yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then along came the Sherman where we got the foundry and machine work right to carry the 75 mil main gun in a single turret. So these things were real high targets. Yeah. And this was this was riveted armor. One real downside to riveted armor is if you're hit by a shell, the shell itself may not penetrate, but it'll break the head off the rivet inside and it'll ricochet around in there. So mm. you can die just as easy from mm -hmm. rivet heads as you can wow. from shell fire. What, what, the very top, the turret, what, is, what does that mean? It looks like it's- That's cast steel. steel. Cast steel, okay. Yeah, it's steel, it's not cast iron, it's cast steel. Uh, and probably on the order of an inch and a half, two inches thick. <laughs> right next to that you have the M18 Hellcat. Even to this day, this is still America's fastest piece of track technology armor. The Abrams are limited by their governor down to 45 miles an hour. The M18s were capable of 55, and they used the nine-cylinder aircraft radial engine coupled to an automatic transmission. Now, they were thin armored. The way that they got that speed was that they were very, very thinly armored, but they had the high-velocity 76 mil gun. Their entire purpose in life was shoot and scoot, roll up fast, find the enemy tanks, kill them, and then run like hell. That was that's the story of my life. That was <laughs> that was their way of fighting. So you take your money and run. Like that. That's right, exactly. Well, yeah, yeah. the other thing too, if you look at it, you're looking looking at the, at the suspensions. You're going to see two different design theories here. This was used on the Shermans, the self-propelled guns, and a lot of other chassis during World War II, but the design by the end of the war had gone to a torsion bar suspension with the large road wheels. This was infinitely better for rough terrain, gave a better ride to the crew, and allowed for higher speeds. I have a question. Okay. When I was in high school, I had an English teacher who said during the war, which I assume he was in, he said you could take a 30-06 and if you hit the pin on the link, you could knock it out. Is that Anywhere near right? 
these, these it would are... have to one it would have to be under no tension whatsoever and the stop blocks on either well especially on these these stop blocks would have to be completely gone now I guess he's talking about a German tank why would you shoot it your own 105 today? howitzer as a self-propelled gun this is known as the M7 priest carries your standard like M2A2 or M1A2 105 howitzer but on a Sherman chassis, and this was uh, oh, a mobile armor store. It is. Yes, yes, it Where did it get its name from? Because of the pulpit. Oh, for the preacher. That's, that's yep. That's where the preacher would stand, manning his fifty. <laughs> that's the gun ring for it. But it's uh, the British actually gave it the name. Now theirs was known as a sexton because it used the British seventeen pounder versus the American. It was known as the priest, and we used a one hundred and five. Um, the British, for some unknown reason, like naming their self-propelled guns after religious figures. Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the current, uh, or, uh, a couple of examples that we have here uh, are known as Abbots, and that is a British uh, chassis built on a 432 armored personnel carrier, but it uses the, the British-built 105 howitzer, uh, again, a self-propelled artillery, and it's known as the Abbot. Yeah. Behind you, you have kind of a rare beast. This is a World War II German Hetzer tank destroyer, very low profile. It's built on a Czechoslovakian-made T-38 chassis, which the Germans captured and had made in great numbers by the Czechs. There were so many different uses for this drivetrain, but one of the latest ones was set up as both an assault gun for infantry and specifically for killing other tanks. Very low profile, very easy to hide behind a hedgerow and just put the muzzle forward and knock out whatever. This is a British Valentine. This would have been appropriate to the tail end of the Desert War with Montgomery chasing Rommel uh, into Tunisia. Um, good tank, good uh, chassis and all that, with the exception that it was completely underarmed. It only carried a British two-pounder, which is roughly the equivalent to the American 37 millimeter. Mm -hmm. It was just too light to do any damage to German armor. And then behind you... This, this is the duster. Mm, this is actually an M19. Uh -huh. The dusters were the Vietnam era, but this was the forerunner to the duster. It used the same weapon, the twin 40 millimeter Bofors, uh, Navy pom-pom guns, basically. Mm -hmm. And they track mounted them. This is the same drivetrain as the very late war Chaffee tank. And then up forward we have a Canadian armed reconnaissance. This is known as a C-15. It uses the engine and drivetrain from the American Deuce and a Half and a four-wheel drive chassis for armed reconnaissance for the Canadians. And then you have two of the three-quarter ton Dodges. You have the M-56, that's a command car. Your battalion commander with all his maps and whatever else would run around in that. And then you have what we call a weapons carrier, a WC-52. Uh, they're Dodge three-quarter ton, powered by a Chrysler 230 cubic inch, flathead six, and mm. just tough as nails. There was also an ambulance version of this, which we do have in another building. Uh, for those of you who are Vietnam era, there are two examples that should be very familiar. The M113 and the M114, troop carriers. Armored troop carriers. Yep. yep. The M113 being the aluminum box. The British built their 432s. I mean, they're, they're virtually the same thing, except the Brits thought the better of it and made theirs out of steel, mm -hmm. not aluminum. Doesn't burn. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the 114 was the, the little brother to it, and as I understand it, it was supposed to be airdroppable. Yeah, big airplane. Uh, <laughs> on the far side over here, we have two of the British Brens, the tracked universal carriers, roughly the same size as the American Jeep. But the Brits used these to great effect for both carrying, uh, carrying troops, carrying machine guns, used them as uh, uh, medical vehicles, as ambulances. And then you have the World War II American Jeep, this particular one being a Ford produced right Jeep here, the one right here. Right, right, on, right over the hood of the, uh, the Dodge there. And the big one in the back, the Jeep? That is a British Morris, which was used both by the uh, British Army to some degree, but quite a few of them also ended up being used by the RAF. Uh, on World their War II? Uh, World War II vehicle, yes sir. Looks terribly British, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs>